All right. Okay, good. It is on. We're ready to go. Um, hi, everybody. We're going to be talking about how resilient supply chains enable food security. And I'm just going to start right off with Mark. Uh, what makes a supply chain resilient, and how has technology played a role in that at Invisible? Sure. So what makes a supply chain resilient is the the surety of that supply chain. So what I, you know, that, that involves a few things. One is the, the conservation of the resource itself. So in, in seafood, it's making sure that it's not overfished or illegally um, caught. Um, or in the case of aquaculture, that it's not uh, environmentally abusive. Um, it's ensuring that the livelihoods along the supply chain are all equitable. So it's ensuring that the farmers are paid equitably, that the labor rights in the processing centers are all just, and that the transportation of that product is done in a responsible manner, meaning the product is authentically delivered at, to the end, and that you're not compounding an environmental issue by having a destructive delivery system, for lack of a better term. Um, and the way that technology helps that at least from an invisible standpoint, is we, we deployed a traceability system across every one of our seafood supply chains where we capture the data that reflects the events as they take place along the supply chain. So it's not just a reporting of chain of custody or what I call like a glorified FedEx number. It's actually like true visibility into the events that take place along that supply chain. And so that, that's how I define it, and that's the delivery of the technology. And the, the end result is that on our, because we do packaged seafood, um, so that you can go into the supermarket and pull the package out of the freezer. And if you're curious if that, you know, wild Alaskan salmon is actually wild Alaskan salmon, you can scan the QR code and it has a verified um, story of the entire supply chain and what took place. So like, what we try to avoid and, and educate our consumers on is the difference from like, yes, it might be fished in Alaska, but that we actually, product of USA means that it's actually still processed in the US, not shipped to oftentimes China and then shipped back to the US as like a, a lower cost way of processing product. And that's what I mean by like a destructive delivery system where you're tripling the emissions of the, of the supply chain to save a quarter. Now, Dion, going all the way through the chain to the consumer level, you see that direct impact on a you know, weekly, daily, constant basis here in Chicago, and you see how that food insecurity affects people's lives. So how did you develop a model with Dion Chicago Dream that meets the needs at that ground level? Well, I think when we talk about the supply chain, um, we only talk about what's popular at that moment. And so what I saw, I'm sorry, my six-year-old has called me 19 times in a row. If anybody has a six-year-old, you know exactly what's going on. Um, he will not take being ignored. Um, but when we talk about the supply chain, a lot of times we look at it from what's popular at that moment. And so what we've seen with Dion Chicago Dream is how do we look at the supply chain from the consumer level and what they experience? And so what we saw was an opportunity to make sure that how the consumer is experiencing the supply chain, they're getting that quality, they're getting a lot of the reassurances, and they're getting the consistency that everyone who's committed to food insecurity work has committed themselves to. And so just making sure that the other side of it, um, we're being held accountable. And at Dion Chicago Dream, we've been able to stabilize last mile delivery, which is something everyone struggles with in every sector all throughout the country. And so what we decided was, how do we make sure that from the uh, consumer's experience, it's equitable, it's quality, it's consistent, and then work our way back. And so from there, we were able to make sure that our sourcing was consistent. We were able to make sure that our team was uh, compensated. We were able to make sure that we were really, you, we could do something and build a platform that then the next year we can grow and not just dismantle it and try to create it again. And it's grown quite a bit. Absolutely. Uh, what started with 30 households per week has grown into 48,000 pounds um, of brand new produce throughout the Chicagoland region uh, per month. Wonderful. Um, Dayani, with going from a, a, you know, this scale to a scale of 
Levy Foods. How do you hold yourselves accountable when it comes to sustainability and support, I'm sorry, and supporting okay. that, supporting that resilient supply? Well, first and foremost, um, it, it is amazing to see food from so many perspectives. I'm a chef. Um, I'm also come from a very large company. We have probably 75% of the portfolio of um, sports and entertainment in the country. And I feel like uh, transparency, we were talking about that earlier, um, maybe being honest when it comes to how much we can impact uh, environment, food insecurity, food waste. I mean, it's, it's major. So for us, we started actually creating tools within our own company to actually say, we have something that is called Waste 2.0. It's actually a system that it's, that it's already in place in all of our properties. Um, and then with that, then we started kind of creating the movement itself where we actually are able to trace it now. Besides that, we work with uh, Food Rescue USAID. And then what we did is we kind of harnessed that movement of how do we donate things? How do we, you know, safely go back out there? Because remember, a lot of other times, especially in our business, one of the first excuses is we can't donate something, we cannot do, you know, cook food, we cannot do this, that. So we found somebody out there uh, that actually helped us to, to create that uh, trace now to as well. So with that said, and that is just two of the things that we are actually putting in place right now, and, and they're working in many, many places, um, I love what Deanne is doing, and, and I feel like everything that is happening right now from Mark, which is actually something that we are looking at, you know, the transparency of where our food is coming from. I mean, I, I, you know, we don't ask for 10 cases of eggs. We probably need a million eggs per year. So with that said, I mean, we are able to break or make something, break or making a small business, uh, uh, I don't know, a farm, we are able to actually also break something, literally. If it doesn't come from the right place, and I need it as a company, um, then that is going to, at the end of the run, you know, at the end of that, is going to create more bad habits, where Mark is working through, towards that, uh, where Dion is working towards that. So for us, I feel like it's it holding us ourselves accountable. It's actually been here today. It's having a seat at the table and speaking of the things that we know we're able to break or make through the process of being so big in the industry. So I feel like that's, that's some of the things, but you know, looking also at, at the environment. I mean, how many pounds and pounds of food we're taking out of the landfills you know, through food rescue, it's major. We were able to do um, about, I think we donated in four years that I've been working with this organization about seven million pounds of food. That's a lot of food that you take off the fields, that you're able to actually source back into the community somehow. And, and I feel like it's major. So I feel like for us, it's about, as a company, it's being transparent. It's actually having a seat at the table and be able to answer some of these questions where before it used to be kind of a closed door conversations of the perception of donating is that we are over, I don't know, overproducing or anything along that line. We are in a business that we're able to still donate food we're able to save waste and we're able to also, you know, impact the supply chain a lot. Yeah. Um, and Michelle, that connection between consumers and farmers is part of what ADM facilitates. How does food security play into that relationship? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, at ADM, we're kind of the big company that nobody knows about because we don't sell to consumers. We sell ingredients to the companies that everybody knows and loves. You know, you go and you buy an Oreo. We actually process the flour that goes to the company that makes that cookie. So think of ingredients rather than final products. And then we work backwards from there. When we look at just our US supply chain, we have 60,000 direct grower connections. And when we talk with consumers, they're interested in sustainability. They want to know where did their products come from? How were they grown? You know, what kind of methods and how does that impact everybody along the supply chain? And then those consumers speak to consumer product companies. And they come back to companies like ADM and say, we need to lower our carbon footprint. We need to have a good farmer story. We want to know about on-farm economics. What are we doing to support growers? And they come to us and say, here are the metrics we want to trace. 
And then what I get to do in my role is then convert that into meaningful and understandable things that we can take to a grower. So I can go to a farmer and say, you need to lower your carbon footprint by you know, two grams per bushel. And they're gonna look at me like, what? I, how do I even measure that? What are you talking about? But if I go to them and say, there's been a lot of research going on on cover crops. When you implement a cover crop between your corn and your beans, you can see that carbon is sequestered in the soil. It increases your soil organic carbon. We're starting to see that your soils become more resilient. You can weather these weather impacts. I'm sorry to use weather twice in a sentence, but you know we, we, we're seeing things like floods, like droughts, like derechos coming through and really impacting things. So when I can sit down with a grower and say, wouldn't it be great if you can improve the resiliency of your farm operation, increase your economics by increasing your yield, all while doing this, reducing inputs, reducing the cost of those impacts, the inputs themselves, what washes down into the waterways, it's a different story. And so being able to translate what consumers want, what companies want, what a lot of these different organizations and NGOs and governments are asking us to do into words that farmers understand and that make sense for their operations is really what we are getting to do. We've stood up a new regenerative agriculture program that we're very proud of because we do now have this team of two or 300 grain originators who now speak sustainability. They can actually talk to a farmer about, oh, you're interested in cover crops, we're paying people to do that. They can tell you all the important details. Let me put you in contact with a specialist. But they're focusing on this. So we can have this conversation upstream and downstream. Wonderful. Um, so I think in 2023, I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone who says, no, I don't care about resilient food supply. I don't care about food insecurity. But even when we have that buy-in on, on that level, whether it's a micro scale or a macro scale, what are some of the challenges or the barriers to you know, solving some of these problems? And, and that can be an open question for whoever would like to touch on it. I think Mark and I, uh, uh, we've been talking about this because of, of the challenges that, we, that we're facing right now is probably transparency. It's very hard to to kind of say, uh, um, you know, I'm green, I'm, I'm impacting some farms, uh, you know, Diane as well, in, in terms of what comes in, you know, we are so used to for something just to appear in front of our eyes. We don't think about the story behind it or where it comes from. I mean, Mark and I, I think of the first conversation was about like, how do you, how do you outsource um, shrimp? And, you know, and, and Mark gave me probably two nightmare stories about shrimp and I'm thinking, holy cow, you know, I used this amount of shrimp last year. How many of those cases came from places that we don't know? And the, the story of this is that, you know, a lot of especially companies, big companies outsource from some places and, you know, all you say is, if it has a little leaf, uh, green leaf on the side, I can click and it's coming from a, from a real place. And, but we don't, we don't really know that. So I think that it's, it's the collaboration. The challenges right now is transparency. Honestly, I, I think I can say that. And I don't think I'm the only one that is, you know, Right now, we're just able to say it aloud. Um, but I think it's the collaboration with a lot of us is going to kind of start, you know, getting all those uh, uh, points together when it comes to that. Um, so for that, for me as a big company or for us as a big company, I think that's what we are trying to really, really tackle is the transparency of where our food is coming from and making sure that it is from the sources that we are able to make an impact from the agriculture side of it. Um, from the small business side of it, and then hopefully, you know, we find good partners, and you know, that's that's what I was saying. Mark and I are kind of <laughs> that's how the conversation started. I mean, I guess I'll I'll take the next uh, step here and and say that you know one of the challenges I think is accountability. Um, so you know, us working across the whole supply chain, one of the biggest struggles we've had is the authenticity of and the accountability of the consumer facing um, entity. So like big companies have a lot of public facing commitments, the supply side of the supply chain sees those commitments and makes the change. So like Newt was talking about just transition. So they make this transition, make the big investment 
and then the end company ends up like not honoring their promises, right? And so then what that does is it then builds a complete mistrust from the, from the farmer standpoint or from the pr primary production standpoint. And then what happens then is the domino effect of that basically erodes the sustainability of the supply chain, but I mean that in like the actuality sense, not in the buzzword sense, where the access to the resource becomes like challenged or at risk. And so that's where this like concept of a just and honest supply chain enables food security because if you've, you've got that mistrust at the source of production and the access to product breaks down, then organizations from the size of a major grocer all the way to Dion will have an increasingly difficult time accessing like food. And then you end up in like the situation where we saw it during pre-vaccine COVID, where you had like empty shelves and short supply and then the price goes skyrocketing, but the no one on the other on either side is winning. It just erodes the entire supply chain. So that to us, I'd say the accountability of the consumer facing point of engagement with food is the biggest challenge. And I mean, just touching on that accountability is also responsibility. I think that the, the way that we enter into this work, even when we were talking backstage, is from a perspective of we're failing. We're not, we, we all have great intention and we all do, do good work, but overall, we have to take responsibility for what we've created. And so getting to that next phase of a resilient you know, supply chain is making sure that even as a black man, how I see myself and where I see myself in the supply chain is equitable, but also understanding that you know, I'm not here to get a pat on the back. We're here to figure out how we can ultimately create a food system and supply chain where what we intend to do is done at the end. And we know that there's a lot of steps in between A to Z, but just making sure that that transparency um, and that accountability is there so that from step A to B, we know what happened. So if there is a fix that needs to happen, it can be made so that the ultimate end user is not affected in a negative way. Excellent. Michelle? I think I would go a different direction with challenges just because I've got a little bit of a different perspective. And I would say one of the biggest challenges that we see is analysis paralysis. Mm. How do we calculate this? How do we prove this? How do we get there? How do we show it? And the answer is if we sit here and figure out what the answer is, we're going to have missed the boat. We have to act now. We have an idea of different practices, of different methods, of different methodologies and measurement schemes that are directionally correct, let's start going down that pathway. Let's start forging relationships along the supply chain. Let's start partnering together. Let's get boots on the ground and start working, and we'll figure out the minutia, the details, as we get there, as they come. Yes, 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 Amen. yes, 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 100%. I, I'm going to say this. We are all so different. We sat down in a room, and we all look at each other and said, how are we going to do, like, kind of connect on what we're doing? And at the end of the conversation, um, we all figured out that we all need each other in so many ways, from the big company to the technological part of what we're doing, from, like I was telling Michelle, you are the beginning of everything because you, you help us. Deanne and I are on the community side of it. But the most important thing is um, my CEO had a conversation with me a couple of days ago, and he said, there's three things that I need you to understand. And then I'm thinking like, okay, he's gonna go on to, and the first thing he said is, this is the right thing to do, period. That's it. I think that's, that's truth. Put on the grounds. We need to actually educate ourselves, our companies, the people that is behind it. Because you'd be surprised when you talk about sustainability and you ask for the description, how many people will look at you like, what? <laughs> I, I mean, it's the truth. And it's, it's nothing wrong with that. I think education is very important. And education doesn't mean that you teach somebody how to do sustainability. Education is simple. To walk into your company, to walk into your leaders, to walk anywhere and say, I have a plan of how to help. Not to teach somebody to, for that, but let's help each other. And I think that is major. So let's okay. just do this because it's the right thing to do for me. 
And then just kind of in our, our last few minutes, whether it's your own company or someone whose company you've seen or a business or a government entity, what's one win this year that kind of shows you that we're going in the right direction? Or what is one, one space or one area or one change that you're like, this is what we're talking about, like this is what we want to see? Okay, I'll, I'll get started. Um, you know, I, I'd say a win, and I, I like to speak from personal experience because then I actually know what I'm talking about as opposed to speculating how someone else did something. Um, you know, I'd say a win that we've had is, and I'll be like the commercial guy up here, I guess, and just go with like a way that we've designed our supply chains in a certain way. We've been able to achieve a, and I'll, I'll go with brands here because it just kind of articulates it, but we've been able to have sourcing in a way using what I described earlier by having visibility to the whole supply chain, et cetera. We've been able to deliver a product of a quality of a very like grocery chain that's known for more expensive products. Um, we've you, we have the same suppliers, but at the price point that's lower than a giant discount grocer. And so the win in that is we've proved that sustainability and delivering a transparent supply chain is actually a cost saving tool. It's not a cost increasing tool. And so it's just a matter of like delivering it truly delivering it. And so that, that's what I go with our win. A lot easier to get the money people to buy in. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's actually, it's more to get people who are doubters and think that sustainability is automatically more expensive to dispel that myth, because it's a total myth. Excellent. I'll speak up like our big win, and again, we're in a bit of a different segment. We launched our regenerative agriculture program. This thing is kind of my baby. We've been talking about sustainable agriculture, regenerative agriculture, through things like Field to Market and some other organizations in North America for eight or nine years now. Last year, ADM officially launched its program. We reached 1.2 million acres. That's nowhere near all the farmland in the US, but that's a pretty big chunk just to start. That means that there were over 1,000 growers that we were going out having conversations about soil health, about resiliency, about on-farm economics, nitrogen fertilizer application, having those conversations, and then having their neighbors call us this year and say, what were they doing? Because their fields looked great. Let's, <laughs> let's have this conversation. Getting that word of mouth and that excitement at the farmer level, I would say is just a huge win that I'm so excited to see. That's great. I think for us is about I think we created our own sustainable way to say it. we are starting from the educational side, which is we are kind of mixing the developing talent within our community and helping to the part of doing food rescue to the part of doing waste. So right now, um, it's part of our KPI as a company, and, and I think that's major. I've always said for an operator, um, if you want to really for them to pay attention, um, kind of go back to their pockets. So I think that it's uh, one of our wins, and then the fact that we actually have a seat at the table as, uh, you know, that I can actually speak with many of our properties around the country and help them. If you don't have a food rescue, let us know. We find you a chapter, we find you somebody, and we are actually being proactive instead of, of saying, how am I gonna put all this food out on the market or, you know, with uh, food rescue, or et cetera, we are actually being proactive. We are planning, so this is the year that we've been planning for next year of how to take big events, waste to the right places of how can we actually save um, on waste as well. So uh, I feel it's, I think the proactivity of the company, it's our big win this year. Great. Definitely, uh, really quick, because I know the team over there is like, hey, you better. I wasn't looking. I already know. Uh, but, uh, but a big win, I think, uh, just looking at it a little differently. Of course, we've tripled production. We've, we've uh, quadrupled the size of our team and hiring in the communities. But for us, I think um, it's telling that from last year, attending this event, 
uh, to this year, we've been able to really branch out in terms of interacting with uh, the supply chain. So to sit here and to know that we've worked with Erica Allen and the Urban Growers Collective, we've worked with um, Growing Home uh, and Janelle's team, we've worked with TFF and Vivery, and we've, we've done pilots to test our product and what we do, which is logistics, against the supply chain to make sure that we can connect in a way that is fitting so that if we have a world scale event again, we're not just looking around wondering what we're gonna do. So I think for us, it's really been making sure that we had partnerships where we can really test our metal and what we've created against the supply chain as a whole. Wonderful, thank you guys all for uh, participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bigger round of applause everyone, this is a great panel. I also wanna thank Newt again for being here. Awesome, thank you so much.